Okay, so now as what I'd like to do is let's talk about, let's go to much more detail concerning pulse sequences and what the different pulse sequences look like. So the standard uh, pulse sequence that we've been talking about starts out with an RF pulse, uh, which produces what we're calling a flip angle. And we've been talking a lot about 90 degree flip angles, but now we're going to talk about other degree flip angles as well. But the standard spin echo pulse sequences starts out with a 90 degree pulse, pulse uh, 90 degree uh, pulse because that gives us, with standard spin echo imaging, the highest signal to noise. So then we, we do that. We get a we get a slice encoded gradient on at the time that we, we give that pulse. Then we do a phase encoded gradient. And then we do something to generate an echo. So far, we've been talking about putting a 180 degree pulse in here. And at time two to out, tau, we get an echo. And then we put the readout gradient on. So then we have the three gradients that allow us to localize the signal intensity in three dimensional space. What about the frequency? What about the frequency encoding gradient? Is that it's called readout here. Another name for that is the readout gradient. This is the frequency encoded gradient is placed on the tissue at the time you read out the signal. Okay. And that's what it is here, and that's why it's called that. Now, Dr. Cruz, a quick question. Yes. On the readout gradient, um, do you have to have a new gradient every time you have a new phase as well as just one readout gradient, even though you're getting multiple phase uh, it's gradients? A, it's the same readout gradient. The slice okay. gradient and the read. Uh, yeah, the readout gradient is the same. But they put a new readout gradient every time you get a new phase echo. Is that correct? Well, you have to generate for every phase using using the standard techniques, and we'll talk about other ones in a minute. Using standard techniques, you need one 90-degree pulse, one level of phase encoding, 180-degree pulse, and an echo where you have a readout gradient for each line of case space. Okay. And by having the readout gradient, it allows you to fill out an entire line. And, you know, like from gotcha. right to left of the body in the direction of the readout gradient, you, you, you basically then can fill in an entire line of case space. But then you need another, another phase encoded gradient to then populate the next line of case space. And you go through all of case space by filling it in that way. Right. Okay. Each one of those, you go through that process once. Yes, that process using standard spin echo imaging, standard, yeah. Yeah, uh, which we don't use anymore, <laughs> but using the standard spin echo imaging, you'd fill one line of case space with every 90 degree pulse, and you do a 90 degree pulse every TR. So the amount of time it takes you to, to fill the case space up once would be TR times however many phase encodings you use. And that's if you just use what's called one nex. If you want more signal to noise, you can do it again and average them two together. That's called two nex, and that doubles the amount of time it takes. And it improves the signal to noise. It doesn't double the signal to noise. It improves the signal to noise only by the square root of two. So by doubling the time, you've improved the signal to noise by about 40%. Now, the time of echo is what? The time of echo is from RF to uh, the echo timer, what's called TE, is from the center of the RF here to the center of the readout gradient here. So TE is this time. Okay. Now, this is using a standard 2D Fourier transform technique. Now, uh, and then you, you get a series of slices. And we haven't talked about it yet, but those slices with this technique usually are not right next to each other because you get crosstalk between the slices. They're usually separated, so you usually have like a three skip point five or a five millimeter skip two type uh, sequences. Uh, the TR is always between the 90 and the new 90. The time between the 90 degree pulse and the 180 degree pulse is called tau. And 2 tau is equal to TE. 
Now that's a that's a two D Fourier transform pulse. Now it turns out that there's another way that you could do this, and that is you can uh, uh, phase encode in two directions. Uh, in this particular case, we basically do, we phase encode in the slice direction, and we phase encode in the say y direction, and do a readout in the in the x direction. So this would be a three D technique. Uh, the problem with this is it takes a lot longer because you're, you're for uh, every uh, uh, you you basically have to pick you have to pick one phase encoding here, and then go through all the phase encodings there. Then you have to pick the next phase encoding here and go through all of the phase encodings there again. So this takes much, much longer than the 2D sequence. And if you use a standard technique, the old-fashioned technique, this could take an hour to do. So in the old days, this wasn't, except from some very special circumstances, this was not a viable technique because it just took too long. Uh, <clears throat> But now with faster sequences that we'll talk about, the 3D sequences are becoming uh, uh, more and more common uh, because we can acquire the data much faster than we were able to before. The advantage of 3D sequences is that they give us better signal to noise uh, and you get slices that are contiguous. There's no skip between the slices. So you tend to get, uh, and this will allow us to put us in a situation where more, we're more where we can start getting close to isotropic voxels, like a CT scanner. And the holy grail is to try to get isotropic voxels, so you, then you can just do one sequence and then reconstruct it in any plane you want. But even at 3T, we don't quite have the signal to noise to do that with adequate resolution on an MR scanner yet. But we'll, we'll go into this more. And you're all familiar with voxels, and so we don't have to go through that. Now, uh, this is a, a technique that I like to use a lot now. It's, uh, it's just been available for the last couple of years with uh, most of the manufacturers, initially with Siemens and, and GE. With uh, GE, it's called Cube. With Siemens, it's called Space. And this is a 3D spin echo acquisition. And you can do it with uh, T2-weighted image, like on the left here. And I sh showed you some of these in the cartilage lecture. Uh, this is with fat suppression on the right. Uh, now. Many people have tried doing these with isotropic voxels, like about 0.5 millimeters, but even at 3T, the signal to noise just isn't adequate for that. So I like to use it as a more of a 2D sequence where we get thin slices, like 1.6 millimeters at 1.5T, or even thinner, and they're contiguous uh, through the knee. So in about six minutes, we can get around 100 uh, slices through the knee that are around 1.6 millimeters in their contiguous slices. And we've found that that increases our sensitivity for cartilage lesions by around 5%, but it allows us to much more accurately determine the size and the edge characteristics of cartilage lesions, something that multiple studies in the orthopedic literature has shown that MR doesn't do very well with 2D techniques. So that's a 3D, uh, 3D technique. And where we have it available now, I like to use this as the primary technique to evaluate the articular cartilage at both 1.5 and 3. We only have it available on a few of our scanners right now. Uh, and these are just other examples. Here's just an example of a, of a defect within the trochlear articular cartilage. And you can see it both without fat and with fat suppression. Here's this kind of correlation between an ideal image. OK. I'm going to have to break here just for a second. Uh, let me stop the lecture. Uh, I've got to take a call. All righty. Okay. So we're just talking about 3D images here, and these just are some examples. And there are a number of papers in the literature that show that 3D is uh, better than 2D imaging uh, for looking at articular cartilage. Because we have the two, the three D imaging only on about only a few of our scanners, so we don't we do it routinely at Tower, on the scanners there and at Orange, and at any of our newer scanners where we have the technique, but we don't do it on most of them because it's and it's expensive to retrofit onto scanners. Are they uh, you could you could produce those as T one and T two weighted as well as PD sequences? It's not sequence specific in that sense. Yes, that's correct. 
So uh, now, uh, so this is really the typical sequence that we talked about with 2D spin echo with the 90 degree pulse, the uh, gradient, 180 degree pulse, and then the readout here. Uh, this would be a 2D spin echo technique, and we've already seen that. Now, in the early days, the way the way this was typically done is you'd get a 90 degree pulse, 180 degree the the phase encoding gradient, 180 degree pulse, and then you get your echo. Then you'd wait a TR time period. Now, usually the echo would be somewhere in the range of you know, let's just say 20 uh, 30 milliseconds. So by the time we get through finished reading the echo, it might be 35 milliseconds after the 90 degree pulse. And the TR, we typically say 700. So there's a lot of time lag here when nothing is happening between receiving the signal and waiting until we give the next 90 degree pulse because we have to wait for the Z component of the bulk magnetization to grow back up again. And the longer the T1, the longer we have to wait for that to happen. Uh, so... Uh, and when you do this, the scan time with standard imaging would be uh, the TR times the number of uh, phase encodings, which we talked about. And then very often uh, we'd have to uh, a signal average, so we'd have to go through that, uh, say, two times. And every time that would double the amount of time, so it would be the next times the TR times the number of phase encodings. So with standard imaging, that's, that's the way you get it. Now, it was recognized early on that maybe we could be more efficient if we got two images for the price of one. So then uh, early on, you, we, you would give 90 degree pulse, phase encoding, 180 degree pulse, you'd get one echo, then you do another 180 degree pulse and you'd get a second echo. So you get an echo that's a short uh, TE echo and an echo that's a long TE echo. Now for the T2 image to be very good, we have to wait a fairly long time on the TR, typically around 2,000 milliseconds at that particular time, uh, in order to have a good signal for the T2 weighted images, which are further out on the T2 decay. So a situation like this, early on, it was typical to get this echo at 30 milliseconds and the second echo at 60 milliseconds for a proton, something like a proton density and something like a T2 weighted, weighted image. And then you'd wait another uh, 1,900 milliseconds, and then you'd give another 90-degree pulse. That would just be one slice. Yes? So each one of those echoes after the – you're you're acquiring a different uh, type of sequence. The first one may go to create, a, like you said, a T2, and the second a proton density? No, no, no. The first one would be proton density, and the second one would be T2. Why is that? Why does the second one have to be the T2? Because the time of echo is increased. Right. In order for a T2-weighted image we talked about, you get a T2-weighted image by having a longer TE. I see. So Remember? it's not – each one you bring down your time of echo. So if the time of echo in the first one is just, say, like 60 seconds, the, the next one's going to be 90 seconds. And if you could even do a third, it would be like 120 Whatever whatever timing you put for the 180 degree pulse will will uh, so here what happens is that you get the first tau would be 90 to 180 degree pulse then at two tau you get an echo then you wait and whatever time period you want to wait you'll get another 180 degree pulse that would be another tau and you'd wait another tau after that and then you'd get your echo in the very early days it was characteristic to have the tau time here to be 15 milliseconds, you'd get a 30 millisecond echo, you'd wait another 15 milliseconds to another 180 degree pulse, and then get a 60 echo. That was just in the mid-1980s, that was kind of a standard pulse sequence that everybody used because it was fairly easy to do, didn't require a lot of electronics or a lot of fancy hardware to do that. We don't do that anymore for so, reasons we'll go into. So that second TE is still calculated from the initial... Uh, 90 degree pulse. Yeah, the T2 time starts at 90 degrees and then it drops off and we're just sampling it at different time periods during the T2 decay. But if you do it this way, you still end up really with only one image and you've got a lot of dead time where you're waiting after getting the last echo, waiting to do the next 90 degree pulse. Uh, you can also do the same sort of thing using first an inversion pulse. We talked about inversion recovery before. You have a 180-degree pulse first. 
you wait till it starts recovering and then you do a 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse and get an echo. And we said if this TI time is fairly short, you can nullify fat signal if you remember. If it's a longer TI, you can nullify water signal. So that's how we get stir images and how we get flare images. So that's just kind of view, and this is just what we looked at before. This would be the inversion time here. You wait a given period of TI, and if it's short, you can catch fat when it has a zero uh, bulk magnetization vector in the Z direction. You give a 90 degree pulse, nothing happens, and you get no signal from it. But you'd still have a lot of signal from the water. Or you can wait longer till water goes to zero, in which case you get a lot of signal from fat. So this would be a flare image, and this would be a stir image. And this just shows a stir image where you can see increased signal intensity within the marrow space with suppression of the fat. And as you all know, the value of stir images. We don't have to go into that. Now, an, now another way to get an echo is called a gradient echo. Uh, Sean, what's a gradient echo? Um, it's an echo where you don't have a 180 degree pulse to rephase. So you, you don't rephase any of the, um, you don't rephase the spin, is, the, is that what I thought was a big difference. Okay, so you don't use a 180 degree pulse to rephase, <clears throat> but to get an echo, you still have to rephase, so what do you use instead? Another gradient echo, I mean, you just put two gradients on. Any, okay, so, they... so so what happens here then, is that you, you we, first we have a pulse here, and typically with gradient echoes, we're going to use less than a 90 degree pulse. And I'll explain why that in a minute. So let's say it's typical. Let's say we give a 30 degree pulse. Then you do a phase and you do a, a phase encoding. Uh, would you ask him if I can call him back in 20 minutes? Okay. Uh, and now, if you notice here that they that they're putting a gradient on in the frequency encoded direction. Uh, here uh, that's negative and then there's a quick reversal after the phase encoding occurs so it's what you're doing here is you're driving the spins out of phase in the X direction only and then you're reversing it and then you're driving them back into phase in the X direction only so the 180 degree pulse basically rephase the spins in two dimensions with gradient echo, we're going to only rephase them in one dimension. So it's less efficient mm -hmm. than a 180 degree pulse, <clears throat> but it, be, it can be done very rapidly and you don't have all of the RF power that you have with a 180 degree pulse. So you're driving them out of phase, then you're driving them back into phase and you get an echo when they, when they come back into phase. Mm -hmm. So that's called a gradient echo. Now, the reason why we do not, do not use 90 degree pulses with uh, gradient echoes is one of the one advantage of gradient echoes is we like to use very short TR times in order to try to speed up the imaging. Now the TR is necessary to allow you to recover the Z component of the bulk magnetization vector. If you give a 90 degree pulse then it's going to take a long time for you to recover uh, bulk magnetization vector in the Z direction. If you give a 30 degree pulse, then after you give the pulse, you still have Z, uh, Z component of the bulk magnetization vector. The Z component doesn't go to zero. It only drops a little bit and you get a little bit of, of XY component. <clears throat> so this means that you don't have to wait a, a long TR because you still have Z component of the bulk magnetization vector. And therefore, you typically give small pulse, uh, the, if you give a pulse uh, flip angle of 30 to 40 milliseconds, you tend to get a T1 weighted like image. If the flip angles drop down to like five or 10 degrees, you tend to get more of a T2 star type image. And uh, all of these are kind of T2 star because you're really driving the, the spins in and out of phase during the T2 star drop off. Yeah. What was that? Could you just explain T2 star again? I'm sorry. T2 star is the time it takes for the uh, is a time constant that tells you roughly the time it takes for the nuclei to get out of phase after the 90 degree pulse from all of the magnetic field inhomogeneities in the substance. 
So it's basically the free induction decay. It's the time it takes for the signal on the free induction decay to drop to about 62% of its maximum value. Okay. Dr. Cruz, is that 62 or is it or is it one third? Because I thought T2 was um, one third and T1 was six. Um, it, it's it's technically defined as one standard deviation, which comes to about sixty-two percent. It's it's not okay. one third. It's roughly two thirds, but it's not exactly two thirds. It's a little bit less than that. But. Uh, which which one is which? T one is 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 two thirds, and no, T two. Yuri, Yuri, it's one. If for both of them, it's one standard deviation. It's the same for both. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thanks. One is one is the time it takes to decrease. The other is the time constant governing the time it takes to increase. The z component of the bulk magnetization vector is increasing, and that's T one. Okay, which is fairly long. The xy component of the bulk magnetization vector is decreasing. That usually happens very rapidly. But uh, one standard deviation is roughly 62%. Uh, the time it takes for the z component to go to 0 to 62% of its maximum value. And t2 is roughly the time it takes for the xy component to go to maximum value to, to lose 62% of, of that. OK, thank you. Yep. Okay. I don't think we need to go through all of this. Well, let's see. Yes, we. Uh, now, with gradient echoes, Well, here's basically what the signal looks like if you do a spin echo. There's a 90-degree pause. You have a free induction decay here that drops off very rapidly. This drops off with T2 star. And then you have the T2 drop off, which is more gradual that we talked about before. Here we have a 180-degree pause. Then at time 2 tau, we get, we get our signal back here. And this is what the echo looks like from the signal, which goes up only to the T2 decay K line. So that's... That's a regular spin echo sequence. In a gradient echo sequence, we give a pulse here. This says 90 degree, but usually it's less than 90 degree. Mm -hmm. You get a free induction decay, which is which is this mm -hmm. signal here, and uh, and then you get a gradient reversal. And, and here, the uh, uh, we can see the signal just recovering up to more more of a T2 star line. And the reason this drops off here is that we're forcing the spins out of phase here, and then we force them back into phase in that one direction. And here the signal goes back up to the T2 star decay line. And this, this, this time is usually much shorter than this time. The concept is the same. The concept is the same, but with the gradients, we're just not using the 90 and 180. We're using shorter angles. You're using usually less than a 90 degree pulse, and there's no 180. Yeah, so so the, the advantage is that the gradient echo can be done faster. You don't have all the time it takes to 180. You've got a lot less power deposition, but uh, but the gradient is the gradient rephasing is much less efficient than the 180 degree pulse rephasing. If you get more of a T2 star type image rather than a T2 contrast image, which means the contrast is often poor on the gradient echoes, because we're using one T2, not T2 star, as a contrast agent. Uh, so I don't think we need to go into this. Uh, and this just shows that now if you do a bunch of uh, pulses, like a bunch of, say, 15 degree pulses uh, at a constant time TR, uh, then w what you'll get is uh, a, a decay, a drop in the Z component after the, the pulse. This would be a, kind of like a 50-degree pulse. Then it would grow back up again until you hit it with another 50-degree uh, pulse or 45-degree pulse. Then it go back up and again. But eventually, you end up with a steady state position here. So the first couple of pulses, 
you'll you'll get a lot of signal, but then you'll come down and and this will be constant. So if you if you give a long series of say more typically 30 degree pulses, then after about five or ten pulses, you'll get what's called the steady state, where the recovery of the Z component of the bulk magnetization vector won't be up to the maximum value, but it, but it will be some somewhere uh, kind of halfway between, and uh, and it will be constant throughout the, the entire experiment. So uh, and we use this sequence, and then every time you give a pulse here, you can do a gradient re, re, refocusing, and you can get a signal, and and also do uh, uh, you can put in. Uh, gradients a number of different ways to tr try to have each of these signals have a different phase encoding so they end up giving you a different part of k space when you're trying to fill k space and this this time the tr time here can actually be fairly short instead of the typical 500 or 3000 milliseconds we we're talking about before it can be 25 to 50 milliseconds which means uh, uh, if it's 50 milliseconds instead of 500 milliseconds and you can do the same kind of encoding information, then you can decrease the time of acquisition by a factor of 10. But you end up with a lot of different contrasts. And there are many different ways to do this, and we're not going to get into all of them now. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of the steady state free precession are, is imaging that's, that's used fairly commonly now in, uh, uh, in MR. And a lot of the 3D sequences which give uh, high fluid contrast. At 3T, we use a, a fair amount in the, in the, in the spine uh, to get 3D high-resolution images of the, of the cervical spine where you can see the neural foramina better and you have good contrast because the fluid is bright or steady-state free precession type images. And you can get several different contrasts from them <clears throat> depending upon when you receive the signal. And this is just, uh, 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 <clears throat> here's a situation where if you have alpha pulses going along and you have a gradient reversal, you get a signal kind of in the, in the center here, you receive it there. Uh, what happens when you start doing these pulses is that one of these pulses uh, turns out to be like a 90 degree pulse. The, the next pulse, uh, uh, well, that's another sequence. That's not here. Let me don't get in that. But here, you can see down here, you can have unbalanced gradients where you basically have a flip here on one side. Uh, you can have, uh, uh, and you can also, you can have balanced gradients where you have flips on both sides and that will contribute to the next echo. And you can see you get different contrasts uh, 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 but between these. Uh, but usually these fully balanced ones are tend to give you very high contrast within the CSF. And these, since these TRs can be very short, you can end up with very good 3D gradient echo images uh, that have good contrast. On that middle one, what's the difference between the middle and the first? The, the way here is that they, they, they do the, uh, uh, the phase increments on the RF such that you kind of spoil any residual magnetization, and that actually ends up decreasing the uh, the signal to noise. So these really these really aren't used in clinical practice. So uh, well, actually, uh, I mean, so 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 the spoiled gradients. Well, now typically. The unbalanced gradients, they have different names, FAST, GRASS, FISP. Uh, the balanced steady state free precession is, in GE term is called FIESTA, and Siemens term is called TRUE FISP. And then in the past, we used to use the spoiled gradient echoes, but we really don't use those anymore because these others give us much better signal to noise. Let's just skip past these. And then we write, this is magnetization prepared gradient echo. You can basically do the same thing that we did before to get a, a stir image or a flare image uh, with gradient echo. You can do a 180 degree pulse beforehand, wait a TI, give the alpha pulse, pulse and uh, phase encoding and do a gradient reversal and get an echo as well. Uh, 
So now I, let's get into uh, kind of fast imaging. Now, so far, everything we've talked about, we fill one line of case space every time we have a TR. Uh, that's not the way we do things uh, much anymore. And uh, this was an early sequence. Let me see. Maybe. Well, th this is an idea of one of the early sequences that could speed this up. And here we have a 90-degree pulse, which is a typical 90-degree pulse. We have a 180-degree pulse. But then notice uh, that they keep switching the, the gradient down here. Uh, and with each gradient, switching of the gradient, we'll get another, another echo. And if you do this and, and change the phase encoding gradients with each of these before each echo, then what, what you can end up having is, uh, is a series of one, two, three echoes here each with different phase encodings for the first echo, and here are three echoes after the, the, the second 180 degree pulse. And what you can then do, and with both of these echoes, you can fill three lines of case space with a single TR. So that can decrease the amount of time it takes to get, uh, to fill up case space by a factor of three. We don't use this kind of imaging anymore, but that was one of the first ones that was used to try to speed up getting case space. We'll come back to how we do it now in just a minute. So gradient echoes, one nice thing with gradient echoes, when you do the 90 degree pulse and the 180 degree pulse, we typically put the slice encoded gradient on both of them. So the only uh, nuclei that see both pulses, and therefore the only nuclei we get signal from are nuclei that were in that slice for both pulses. And what happens, though, between the 90-degree pulse and 180-degree pulse, especially if it's a long TE, is if you have moving, moving spins, like in arteries, the nuclei can move between the 90-degree pulse and 180-degree pulse. Uh, if it's fast enough, the nuclei in the artery that saw the 90-degree pulse may move completely out of the slice by the time the 180-degree pulse comes around. So they'll only see the 90-degree pulse, and they'll never see the 180-degree pulse, so that when you get the echo, you'll get no signal in the echo from, from those nuclei. So if you have a, a typical 2D image, and you look at it, the, arter the arteries, like the aorta, typically are black. And they're black, not because they don't have a lot of water in them, but because the nuclei didn't see both, both uh, pulses, and therefore you couldn't get signal from those nuclei. Now with the gradient echo, what happened? Now, now with the gradient echo, uh, that slice will see the first pulse, but when you do a gradient reversal, the entire body sees the gradient reversal. That's not slice localized. So those spins will see both the 90 degree pulse and the gradient reversal uh, and, and will give signal back. Now the issue can be, however, if they move by the time you get the readout gradient, then the readout gradient may, may think that they're in a different location because, because they are in a different location, so it may mismap the signal. But typically with gradient echo imaging, we get very good flow-related enhancement. So most non-contrast bright blood uh, angiogram techniques use gradient echo techniques to do that. And this is just an early example of gradient echo technique. Uh, so where was it that the flow was slow void work? That would mean standard spin echo? Standard spin echo, right. Spin echo is like flow void gradient echo. Yeah, and, blood. and we'll go through that a little bit more detail in a minute. And here's just uh, gradient echoes showing uh, bright uh, CSF. Now, this is not a technique we really use much anymore, but at one time we, we used it. Uh, uh, but the main reason it doesn't give good tissue contrast. You see. Now, why don't we stop here? The next technique I'd like to talk a little bit about is a T1 row technique, which is used a few places. Not a lot of places, but I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And we'll go through some of the more complicated pulse sequences uh, tomorrow. Okay, any questions at this point? 
Okay. Then uh, I'll see everyone tomorrow. Thank you.